بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We're looking at the chapter in relation to Allah saying فأمنوا مكر الله فلا يأمنوا مكر الله إن القوم الخاسرون Did they then feel secure against the plan of Allah? None feel secure from the plan of Allah except the people who are lost or losers. Surah Araf, Ayah 99. So here, this chapter, in relation to the previous chapter, the Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam, what he's trying to do, he's trying to connect a benefit, which is that the disbelievers who do not give Allah his tawheed by committing shirk, Allah gave them bounties and blessings. And due to these bounties and blessings, they should not feel secure from the plot or plan of Allah. It should not lead them to feel secure from the plot and the plan of Allah. Just because Allah has given someone provisions and wealth, it doesn't mean He's pleased with them. And that they will obtain the akhirah. And this is something very relevant because we know in our society today there is that misconception. That if we have wealth and status, it means Allah is pleased with us. Wealth and status Allah give to anyone, those who believe and those who don't believe. It's iman that defines people. So here, Allah is reminding us that to feel secure against Allah's plot is a sin. It's actually an iqab, a punishment. Because when people feel this way, this is when Allah punishes them. So Shaykh Ibn Uthaymi then says the two matters we take from the chapter. Number one is feeling secure against the plan and plot of Allah. And number two, losing hope in Allah's mercy. The chapter is going to talk about these two, feeling secure from Allah's plan, and the second one, losing hope in Allah's mercy. And I believe it should not be having any of these two. Both are extremes. So Allah says, did they then feel secure against the plan of Allah? And here is referring to the people. Allah says, أَفَأَمِنَ أَهْلُ الْقُرَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتِيَهُمْ بَأْسٌ بَأْسًا بَيَاتًا وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ أَوَ أَمِنَ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتِيَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا ضُحًا وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ أَفَأَمِنُ مَكْرَ اللَّهِ فَلَا يَأْمَنُ مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Allah says, did they feel, did the people of town, or towns, did they feel secure against the coming of Allah's punishment by night, while they are asleep? Or did the people of the towns feel secure against the coming of our punishment, in the forenoon, while they play? Do they then feel secure against the plan of Allah? None feel secure from the plan of Allah except the people who are losers. So we benefit from this. Allah is addressing these people that He can punish them in different ways. While they're sleeping. Shaykh says here means perfect security. When you sleep, you're in comfort. And the punishment will come to you then. Or in the duha time, when you're playing. Again, time of comfort, time of ease. Allah can destroy you in your livelihood. So here, Allah is warning us we should not feel safe from the plot of Allah. وَلَا يَأْمَنُ مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ That means except for those who are failures, who are losers, and that means that they, the doer, is the قوم, the sifa, the adjective, خاسرون. They are failures or losers. So here, Shaykh says, how can we attribute the makar, the, 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 the attribute of plotting and planning to Allah, despite it being apparently blameworthy? So we know from the sifat of Allah, all of them are beautiful and lofty. Allah has beautiful names and lofty attributes. وَدِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءَ الْحُسْنَىٰ فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا But to belong to Allah is the most beautiful names and most lofty attributes to supplicate to Him through His names. So how can, with this ayah, then we say that Allah has the sifat of makar, the attribute of plotting and planning. So the shaykh says in replying to this, makar is praiseworthy when it shows strength of the person carrying out the makar, means carrying out this plot and plan, that he can overrun his enemy in opposition. So these, this kind of sifa, and those type of sifa that fall in this category, which in and of themselves are not praiseworthy, but in relation to something else, means in relation to the enemy and overcoming them, then it is praiseworthy. This is called, of the sifa to muqabala. The sifa that are attributes in exchange or encountering. So in this case, by itself, if you say Allah is a makir, which is not from his names. Sheikh says, we can't say that. Because it's negative. 
Bayat Sab. When we say, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ مَاكِرِينَ Now it's praiseworthy. Because the enemies, they plot, and Allah plots. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ مَاكِرِينَ In this angle, Allah is overcoming them, now it's praiseworthy. So these type of sifat, you cannot just attribute to Allah without qualifying them. So these sifat, sifat al-muqabara, you don't just leave them like this, in exchange, in against something. Therefore the shaykh says, what does makr mean? It means to succeed in overrunning the opposition from angles he doesn't expect. Makar, plotting and planning, means to overcome the enemy and opposition from angles he didn't expect to come from. So for those reasons, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described war, al-harb, as khadi'ah, as deception. Because in warfare, you're trying to overcome your enemy. There is plotting and planning. It's Hadith Bukhari. So now we can understand how Makar and other, other types of attributes like this are ascribed to Allah which in and of themselves are not praiseworthy, unless in exchange or against something else, countering something else. And we should always remember, when it comes to Allah's attributes, Allah He gives us affirmation attributes which are beautiful, lofty, complete. Then there are attributes He denies for Himself. Sifat, salabiyya, those which He denies for Himself, which are absolutely unbefitting for Allah. Dying or eating and things of this nature. Oppression, Allah denies for Himself. Then their attributes like this. In of themselves, they're not praiseworthy. But if you to match them against something else, like in this case, they trying to plot against Allah and His belief and the believers, then Allah wa khairu Allah is the best of that. Then the Shaykh he mentions here the point of the chapter is that they feel secure from Allah's plot. It means disbelievers. And so in reality, this is something of punishment. The believer should never feel safe from Allah's plot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He can do anything. He punishes people in different ways. And so for some, when Allah gives them blessings and bounty and wealth and status, they feel comfortable, secure. Allah can't punish me now. And the Quraysh, they had this. They said, نَحْنُ أَكْثَرُ أَمْوَالًا We have more money than you, Muhammad. And more awlad, and more children. نَحْنُ مُعَذِّبِينَ How can we be from those who are punished? See this fikra today, we have people even in this area, in this city, and other cities, who had those kind of beliefs. Allah give me wealth, Allah give me status, how can I not go to paradise? He said, no, this is not how it works. Money and wealth, it doesn't put someone in general like this. It's very important. So this here is showing that I believe it should always be having khawf. And we covered the chapter before khawf is ibadah. It's important. Fear of Allah is to worship. So if someone reaches this state where they have aman, safety from the plot of Allah and the plan of Allah, then he's not doing the ibadah of khawf. In fact, he's committing a sin. Also betrayal. She gives another example. Betrayal is similar to Mecca, plotting and planning. Allah should not be attributed with it absolutely because it's blameworthy in every circumstance. But it is a plot in the circumstance of trust. And that is blameworthy. Allah says, When you read khianatak, فَقَدْ خَانُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَأَمْكَنَ مِنْهُمْ But if they intended to betray you, O Muhammad, they have already betrayed Allah before you. So He gave you power over them. So Allah did not say that He betrayed them. As for khadi'ah, deception, it's just like makar. means the same way it operates. By itself, it's not a praiseworthy attribute, but in return to, or an exchange or counter, another attribute it can be. And the Shaykh Ibn then, rahimahullah, he focuses on the, the point of this, uh, which is that someone should exercise caution about the favors of Allah bestowing, bestowed on a servant. For fear that it might be temptation, because every favor deserves that you give thanks to Allah for it, by being obedient to the bestower of the favor. If you do not, despite the abundance of the favor, then you should realize that such is from the plans of Allah. And this is something we should test ourselves with. If Allah gives us more, are we more grateful to Him? If we start feeling safe and secure, and we're continuing with disobedience and sin, in reality this could be a punishment of Allah. It's only a gradual pulling. And the proof for this is actually a hadith. Imam Ahmed reports, and it's Sahih, Shaykh al Bani, greater authentic. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ اللَّهِ يُعْطِي عَبْدِ If you see Allah giving a servant, مِنَ الدُّنْيَا From the dunya, means pleasure, bounties. وَهُمْ مُقِيمٌ عَلَى مَعَاصِيهِ And he is established upon disobedience of Allah. مَا يَجِبْ Means, مَا يُحِبْ means that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love, فَإِنَّمَا هُوَ إِسْتِدْرَاتِ It's only gradual pulling. Allah is only gradually pulling this servant to punishment. And then he read the verse, Rasulullah said, he read the ayah, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ 
فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبَابَ كُلُّ الشَّيْءٍ So when they forgot that which we have, reminded them of, and of the confidence of Allah and the religion, we open for them every door of the dunya. حَتَّى إِذَا Then Allah says, then they entered into all of these type of dunya materials. أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْدَةً فَإِذَاهُمْ مُبْلِسُونَ Then we took them in punishment suddenly, and they were all in, in confusion and inability to escape. So here's a benefit that as a believer, we should never feel that if I'm getting everything, job is easy, family is easy, life is easy, and I'm not doing upright deeds, I'm not a, upright, a righteous person. This is a dangerous state. Some people say, this is what I deserve, I'm doing good, life is good. Allah says, we gradually pull them from where they don't see it coming. Give them time, no spite. So this is something we should always check ourselves. The more we obtain, where is my, where is my ibadah? How is my iman? How is my akhlaq? How is anything I'm doing good? Is it increasing? That's how you know you're being grateful. I'malu ala Dawood shukran. Ala Dawood lost his work in, out of gratitude. Waqalilu ibadi shukran. How few of my servants are grateful? So one thing we should try to train ourselves is that it's not about obtaining the dunya. And we're not upright. When we get a lot, some of the sahaba used to get worried. Now if the dunya was open to them, that this is something a bad sign. It means they're getting everything, everything in the dunya they need, they want. Because Allah says, but the disbelievers, أَذْهَبَتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِمُ الدُّنْيَا You've taken everything, and you, they've tasted the joy of their dunya already in the world life. It means their bounty. So some of the sahab, when they, when they found this, they found this challenging. They said, how come I'm getting everything here? That means that I have nothing in akhirah? Because I'll describe disbelievers this way. They get everything. And also we know that for some people, that is a punishment. So one of the mistakes we need to correct also is when we see people who are non-Muslims or who are Muslims and they're not upright and they have money and wealth, we don't eye them and say, oh, I wish I had. This person is in good state, I'm in a bad state. If you're upon iman and khayr, and you have good manhaj, you're upon khayr. If you have dunya, you don't. This is the best thing you have, is your deen. And when we look to people and say, oh, this person he has, I don't have. And their disbeliever is even worse. Allah says about them, don't be, don't be surprised with their wealth and their children. What does Allah want from this? Is Allah said all of this they're giving them is all of this is type of a punishment. Allah says this is a punishment. So Allah may take their souls, boom kafiru. And they disbelieve us. So sometimes this is also a punishment. Obviously, if someone's righteous and he has wealth and status and money, Allah is giving him as a test, then it could be something khay for him. As long as his iman and taqwa is there. So when we benefit from this is that for us as Muslims as well, we should not reach this state. And when we get a lot, we forget Allah's punishment. We start feeling secure. We're not doing more good deeds because it may apply to us. The next verse, Shaykh Hussain means, قَالَ وَمَنْ يَقْنُطُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّهِ إِلَى الضَّالُونَ Who despairs of the mercy of his Lord except those who are astray? So the other opposite. So one is feeling secure of Allah's plot and plan. The next side is somebody who he despairs of Allah's mercy. It's haram as well. A major sin to despair of Allah's mercy. Someone who believes I did so much wrong, Allah can't forgive me. So here, Shaykh said, Qunut, this is extreme despair. A person would despair and preclude hope and prospect thinking that achieving his desire or removing his grief is improbable. And this is obviously bad because it's su'a dhan billah. He's thinking bad about Allah. Allah can do anything. Allah akulu shayin qadir. Whatever circumstance you're in, you could do the worst of sins, Allah can still forgive you. And Allah yaqfiru dhanubi jami'ah. Wa yaqfu an kathir. Allah pardons much. And somebody for his financial situation, it could be he say, you know, I'm, I'm poor as poor. I have nothing. Allah, he can give you whatever he wish. So someone can never reach his state, except Allah says those who are dalun, those who are misguided, because how can you think of Allah, about Allah so lowly? Do you get to this point where you think Allah can't forgive me, Allah can't provide for me, Allah can't take me out of my situation? A person must take the proper means, this is important, but never you reach that point. When this story came, or this ayah in relation to, to Ibrahim a.s., Allah says that he was given the glad tidings by the angels that during his old age that he will receive a child. And then the, the angels say to him, we give you glad tidings in truth, so be not of those despairing ones. And Ibrahim said, who despairs of the mercy of his Lord except for one is astray? So they're reminding him as well. That even in your old age you can still have, Allah can still provide. Allah wa Krishna Qadir. So the second cha- side of this chapter is not to have qunut. This kind of despair, deep despair of Allah's mercy. And we know Allah's rahmah. Wasi'at kullu shay. It covers everything. In the rahmati ghalabat ghalabi. My mercy, Allah says, overcomes my wrath. So someone should always have with him both hope and fear. This is Ahra Sunnah al Jama'ah. Hope and fear. Khawf al Raja. 
And asr the ibad mahabba, love for Allah. So if you're between this, you'll be safe from these things. And the Shaykh explains here, uh, in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says despairing about Allah's mercy is not permissible because it entails thinking negatively about Allah. And this is from two sides, that he constitutes, that it constitutes doubting Allah's ability. Second one is that it constitutes demeaning Allah's mercy. Note that the alarm had gone off in the building and thus this session was momentarily paused. Now follows the remaining of this session after the alarm turned off. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. So looking at that narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he says some of the gravest of major sins is associating partners with Allah, feeling secure from Allah's plot, losing hope of Allah's mercy and foreclosing the removal of his difficulty. So this narration is reported by Abdul Razak and Tabarani and others. It's a sahih narration. Akbar al-kabayr ishraqu billah wal-aman min makrillah wal-qunut min rahmatillah wal-yas min rawhillah. So here, the shahid obviously is the two that we're covering, which is to feel secure from Allah's plot and losing the hope of Allah's mercy. And so because it's from the kabair, this shows you that it's not something a believer should have. And we should obviously distance ourselves from it, for whenever we hear something from the major sins, it's not allowed to perform it. And if we fall into it, we will repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh Uthimin then gets into a small difference of opinion. How many major sins are they? Are there? Uh, we discussed that before in the Manzuma al Kabair of Hajjawi. That the ulama differed. So some of them mentioned a fixed number. And some of them said that it's more than that. So some said something like four to seven and nine and like this. Until some of them said seventy or more. Until we mentioned the utmost number of some scholars in their narrate. Like Imam uh, Ibn Hajr al-Haytami, he mentioned something around 400 different major sins. And so the difference there. The Shaykh says to begin to count them and research the text reported regarding them is something which is a lot. So it's also said that there are limited numbers. So this is a khilaf. However, we know the condition or the definition. Whatever has a specific punishment in the worldly life or the hereafter, whether that means losing something, desires, or falling to difficulty. Shaykh Islam Taymi, he mentions, this is what a major sin is. Some they specified more punishment, specific in the dunya and akhirah, or a had, or la'na, or some kind of curse, or putting, being threatened with the hellfire, or losing or decreasing your iman, or even the wordings, laysa minna, he's not one of us, all these are signs of a major sin. So the fact is that these are major sins. These two that we're discussing, I believe it should not be uh, with them. The Sheikh then discusses how major sins are not forgiven except by tawbah, and then the minor sins they can be forgiven due to different ibadat. For example, salawat, khams, you do every day, or hajj, umrah to umrah. But generally, tawbah from everything. You should make tawbah from all sins. Unless those who don't repent, or I mean, uh, don't make repentance, I make tawbah, then those are, are, are those who are oppressors. So we should repent anyways, for all sins. But the scholar specified it for tawbah because that's one of its conditions. One of its ways to, to get rid of it. And we're saying at the end as well, that when it comes to iman, a believer should have khawf ur raja, fear and hope. And this is what Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah they teach. And we said before in our lessons, we should also have with it as well the mahabba. Which is asr of ibad is the love, loving Allah. But when it comes to now having love or, or hope, when do you have fear? Uh, a benefit, Shaykh Abdul Rahman bin Hassan al Shaykh, Fatih al Majid, he says that the Salaf recommended to strengthen the fear during the times of good health. So when you're healthy, and this is when people fall into the amen, right? Feeling the security in Allah, from Allah's punishment, we should have more khawf. When you fall into sickness, they recommend you have more raja. Allah cure you, Allah forgive you, you die there, you, you know, you have good husn, you know, husn done billah, Allah will forgive you, you go to Jannah. So some of the Salaf, they recommended this, and he mentions the example of Abu Sulaiman al-Darrani, rahimahullah, when the Salaf, he was of this opinion. But what's more nice, or like I was mentioning, and which is a very good benefit, Ibn Qayyim, Shaykh Muhammad Hizam quotes Ibn Qayyim saying, Akman ahwal, the best situation, is to have i'tidal, this kind of equality for raja'a wal khawf, 
for hope and fear, you should have an equality in them, balance. وَغَرَبَتُ الْمَحَبَّةِ And have an overcomingness of love. This is what drives you to worship. Then he gave the parable which mentioned, if you have, for example, a riding animal, the mahabba is like the riding beast itself. The sa'iq, the one that's driving, is, is, is khawf. The fear of Allah is driving for us forward. The one that guides us along with it is the raja, your hope. And all of this is encompassed by Allah's bounty and ability. It means Allah is the one who gives us, He is the one who gives us tawfiq, muwafaq. He gives us ability to reach what we're reaching. So that's a nice parable. Some they mentioned like the bird. Right? So the body being the love and then the two wings, hope and fear. Right? Or the head. Right? Uh, so this is the, these are nice parables to help us understand how we should be. So in, not, in some, this chapter is, is, is in relation to what we mentioned before of having fear of Allah. And then going forward, which is that if we don't have the fear of Allah, and the believer should fear Allah the way he deserves to be feared, then he will be tested with this chapter, which is have been fear uh, security from Allah's punishment. Or the one on the other side, qunut, from uh, Allah's mercy, the despairing of Allah's mercy. And that's not the way of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And so we should always remind ourselves of that. As for Yais, when this year is referring to a person who rules out his difficulties being removed. I mean, someone who believes that Allah can take away from him the difficulties in his life. Well, Allah tells in the Quran the exact opposite. That Allah is the one who removes difficulties during the time of difficulty. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. So that's the nutshell of the chapter is about. Not very long. And we want to repeat that element. Also, side benefit, there's a narration that's ascribed to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu that uh, Shaykh quotes Ibn Uthaymeen. That he said, لَأَيْنْ أَحْلَفْ بِاللَّهِ كَاذِبًا If I were to swear by Allah, lying. أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَنْ أَحْلِفْ لِغَيْرِهِ صَادِقًا That I to swear by Allah, lying is more beloved to me than to swear by other than Allah telling the truth. This narration, it's going to come later on as well in the chapter or this book. Shaykh Muhammad Hizam in the authentication, he says that if this narration is ascribed to Ibn Mas'ud, then it's not authentic. But if we were to say that it's actually Ibn Umar who said it, then it can be authentic. Because the Rawi, he just mentions Abdullah, he doesn't clarify Ibn Mas'ud or Ibn Umar. So Allah Alam may be more correct that it's Ibn Umar. So that narration is, then will be correct. And that's a benefit as well that believers should never swear about in Allah. Uh, Shaykh mentions it more than once, but I just want to mention the authenticity of that statement. Right? It's a poor proving the point, you should never swear about in Allah. Always swear by Allah, even if you're lying, which means that's a sin, but it's not worse as committing shirk. By swearing by Allah, a minor shirk. So shall we end with this much? If someone has any questions, yes. Uh, the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud about the four major sins, the last one, foreclosing the removal of his difficulty, what does that mean? It means that somebody who loses hope, Allah can remove difficulty in his life. So whatever you're coming across, you feel Allah can't help you or no one can help you. And this is not the way to believe it. You should always have hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can. And also yaqeen, certainty. Allah can remove any difficulty. Any difficulty in your life. So you should never be in a state where you have disparity. No, that's it. I'm, I cannot get out of this. So, and we know this. is Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. How does it differ from uh, losing hope in Allah's mercy? Yeah, well, some of them, uh, in this case, difficulty. Another one could be even losing hope in Allah's forgiveness. You want to hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you or to aid you. So one of them is specific the karab, the difficulty you may go through in your life. And this is important. The difficulty that tests us for, to increase our iman. All difficulties in our life is in, in the expiate sins or to test our iman or to give us higher darajat in akhirah. So we should not try to shy away from difficulties. And this is important. If someone you find in difficulty, you aid them. But you yourself, you shouldn't be trying from difficulties. Allah will test you in different ways. Allah created us with kabat. Always will be toiling. Always will be in some difficulty. So it could be in private, it could be in public, it could be in relation to other people, it could be in relation to your own personal self. So I believe I should always uh, remember that Allah tests us and puts trials so He can increase us. And we shouldn't feel that we're being right, uh, harmed. This is important. And of course you run, you flee to Allah. Rasulullah is sunnah, whenever something distressed him, فَزِعُوا إِلَى الصَّلَةِ He used to hasten to the prayer. That's the sunnah. That's how you deal with it. Return back to Allah, He'll remove it. As a benefit, I mentioned in secret, a benefit, if something harms you, or you find difficulty in your life, make a istighfar. Istighfar is a cue for many things. Poverty, istighfar is a cue for difficulty in your, any situation. And scholars derive this from many ayat, they mention this to be one of the wisdoms 
Istighfar, it cures so many issues. And difficulty in life. It makes istighfar, Allah will remove you from it. Because where did the troubles come from? Sin. So it makes istighfar from the dunab, Allah removed this. Allah said, no affliction afflicts you, illa bima kasabat aydikum. But you have earned with your own hands. So if you understand that, you say, okay, I earned this. From what I know and my own deficiency, my own sin, Allah knows, maybe Allah is testing me, but I know I'm sinning, doing wrong. I make istighfar from it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove it. So this is more istighfar, is so important. And something also mentioned regarding the wealth and status, or like you want to have a family and istighfar. Istighfar is a secret, it's very important. A lot of times we, we forget that. Make istighfar a lot. Astaghfir rabbakum illa kana kaffara, yurisil as-sama alaykum itarara. And they mentioned from the ayah as well. So that's another benefit in general. You find difficulty in life, a lot of istighfar. And many people also, they witness that themselves and make a lot of istighfar, a lot makes things easy. Um, yes. Yeah, it's still forgiving, like asking for forgiveness. I have forgiveness. Exactly. It says, Astaghfirullah. If you add to that, Astaghfirullah, I seek your forgiveness and I repent to you. This is all khair. And it's also good. Yom al Qiyamah, this is one of the ways that someone becomes successful. Tuba, the Prophet said, May he be granted to in Jannah man wajida fi sahifatihi istighfar and kathira. We'll find in his book, Yom al Qiyamah, a lot of istighfar. So, istighfar is a lot, it's very beneficial. And we know also, with that taqwa, Fearing Allah, Allah will give you a way out. But that's the thing, people have to be patient and Allah's suffer comes with it because if you fear Allah, it doesn't mean instantaneously you will see everything that you want. But we know, the person who fears Allah, Allah will give them a way out. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, I have a question regarding like, uh, Istifar asking for forgiveness. So, uh, like, uh, I heard that, I'm aware that when we ask Allah for forgiveness, you have to be sincere. Yeah. Right? So, but, uh, for, like, for example, if, if if an individual is very much like addicted to a sin, or maybe not addicted, but he, he keeps doing the sin over and over again, then, uh, you know, he might be faced with the difficulty, sh- should I ask Allah for forgiveness? Because if, if I ask Allah for forgiveness, I know that I'm just going to commit it again. So, therefore, I'm, I'm not really sincere. And then you might end up not asking Allah for forgiveness. So, you're in this kind of conflict. Yeah, so this will become the plot of shaitan, that he wants you not to make istighfar and keep doing the sin. And you know you're going to keep doing it, so you give istighfar and you keep doing more sin. And that's what Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, a person, even if he makes a sin a hundred or how many times he wants, as long as he keeps returning back to Allah, Allah Subhanahu will forgive him. Hayat Bukhari, Allah Subhanahu Wa says, that my servant, when he seeks your forgiveness of me, Allah will say, I forgive him. And I say, Allah, I seek your forgiveness, means he made the mistake, and he does it again, he turns back to Allah. Also, keep forgiving him as long as he keeps asking you forgiveness. So the idea is you keep doing that until one day you give up the sin. And that's the nature of istighfar and ibadat. You cannot continue so far on these things until eventually they leave you off on these things. And that's why somebody should never give up. Even if he's doing very bad things, pray the salah, make istighfar, a tawbah, one day you will stop these things. But if you say to yourself, look at me, I'm doing the worst of sins, there's no hope. <laughs> you follow the chapter we're talking about here. You forgot Allah's mercy. <laughs> what is it that we, we cannot be forgiven? And also, if we don't make istighfar, how are we ever going to improve? We're not taking any means. And how do we know we can't give up that sin? Shaitan will tell you, you are just an addicted. There is no hope for you. You've already done this so many times. So you tell yourself that I can't be forgiven. Or I, can't, I will never stop. You don't know that. And we know that from the Sahaba themselves, that when they came to Rasul some of them, they, when the, before the ayah came in, ayat in Surah Zuma, they believed that we committed zina a lot in jahri, we killed a lot of people. How is Allah going to forgive us? Allah said, and the real eye, go, save our servants who transgressed in sins, and they're a lot. Do not forget or lose hope in the mercy of Allah. And this is in Jahiriyyah, they did this a lot. So for a believer, she always know I'm still a Muslim, I'm still a believer, I have one with Iman, make istighfar, and keep doing it, Allah will give you a way out. And this is the, this is the key. As for if you give it up altogether, then this will increase you in sin and transgression. And that's what scholars say, whenever you sin, it usually gives birth to another sin. And sin gives birth to transgression and humiliation. So we give them, humiliate them when they do sins. So when you do sins, generally speaking, it leads to bigger sins or more sins. But if you're not stopping yourself with any istighfar, what's going to happen? You tell yourself, I'm not sincere, do more sin. The more when you get some sins, sin, so you, you fall into this sin, which you forget Allah's, you just fear Allah's mercy. And then you, then, you, then you start doing anything you want now. You say, Allah will never forgive me anyways. So that's why it's so important for a believer, even the person who... Uh, is in disparity or who feels this way should never feel that way. They don't give up. Allah alam. 
So being in like uh, this university environment, a lot of us uh, were faced with and uh, exposed to a lot of fitna. So how, like, what are some tips that you could give us that will help us increase in taqwa? So these kind of environments, that the most important thing someone should be doing, of course, is that you should always be reminding themselves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the basis of the, to have the taqwa, you have to remember him. And it's quruh wala tansa. Remember him, don't forget him. Even when he described taqwa, he said to remember Allah, don't forget him. So in these environments, if you're always just busy yourself in the dunya and the school and the, what's around you, and you forget Allah, this is when the first step to commit the sins you do. Remembering Allah is so important. Stay with the people who are sadiqeen. Wakuna ma sadiqeen, those are righteous. And remember Allah and do your salawat and things of this nature. And secondly, learn the gaze. You have to lower his gaze. Stay from the from the makin, the places of sharr. Of course, you, if you're here just to study, you study and you leave the study. If you're in the study, you go and you come to, to pray or you go to the good places away from where the fitness is. Or you go home or you go somewhere else. That's it. That's the best way to do it. But to linger around the place where the fit in and say, oh, it's a tough place. Why are you in the place of fitna? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi especially reminds us when you hear about stuff like this we see today, in the Sa'id and Jinnah Fitan, the happy ones want to avoid fitna. So lowering the gaze is so important because the fitna is huge here, we know, with the women. And this is the strongest of fitna. Along with that also, is that we make sure that you're not hanging around people who are not upright. But all those people, they get ruined by the companionship. Hang around someone who is lower than them in the religion or someone who is not even practicing. So they teach you, you're doing da'wah or they're doing da'wah to you. One of the two. So if you hang around someone like this and they're taking you here, oh, we're going to go over there. Even if you're good attention, we're just going to eat over there. You know there's fitna there. They'll take you to the wrong places and you get attracted, you get uh, you know, affected. Because the qulub are not in our hands. It's very important. Some people, they feel I'm tough. I can handle it. It's not in our hands. This is important. Our, our righteousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who keeps us upright. If He wants to misguide us, He can misguide us. And we seek Allah's refuge from that. And he wants to keep you firm, he can. But you have to avoid those people in those places. So in this kind of environment, you stick to your business. You come to study, study. You work, work. And we finish that, always during this, remember Allah, lower your gaze, keep a good people, and just do your business and leave. Well, instead of mingling around and trying to look and see and find. And of course, busy yourself. When you're not busy, this is a very dangerous thing. Sometimes people on campus, they have nothing to do. Why are you here? This is, one of you. This is opening yourself to opportunity for wrong. You keep busy. Well, it's so important because we're not busy, we get busied. And what do you get busy with? What is here? So it's very important that especially those people who are in this environment they do these kind of things. Of course, if you can avoid it altogether, this is the best of it. But if someone is here and he has, he needs to, he does what he does and he leaves it and he always remembers Allah. This is important. Protect yourself against the things you see and things you hear and those around. And also we shouldn't be uh, lowering our standards means the more we come, we shouldn't continue to normalize and justify. It's all wrong with what we're doing. And you see it, it gets worse as the past time passes. As that should be a sign to you as well, that you thank Allah. That Allah guided you and the people who have found us are so misguided. You should not feel, again, I'm here safe. You say, subhanAllah, me, I'm Muslim, I pray, I'm okay. No, as long as I'm in the environment, I could be tempted. I could be tempted and seduced to the wrong. At the same time, we should also try our best to be active in some khair. At least you can justify and say, you know what, if I'm at least I'm coming here in these environments... Let me help other people. All right, we can do some da'wah, you can do some khair, as long as you're around. You can tell people what's right and what's wrong. You can try to rectify the wrong in some elements. If you're able, if you're not able, then perceive yourself. That's the best. And this is some advice. Of course, we know it's more complicated than that, but this is important. Remembering Allah, being good company. And keep focused on what you're doing. If you're studying, just study. If you're working, just work. You know, Don't go and say, I'm going to sit in this social and this gathering, and I'm going to meet this one, and then just explore until you end up in yourself and in place to fit in. And you can get out. Also avoid the places where there are doubt. Right? For example, you come to a place, it's a bad area. Go to the side street, you don't have to go to that main street. You could, be, you could be accused by someone. What are you doing on that street? It's hard to tell, I'm just passing. <laughs> so that's not the street you pass. You know, that's not the one. So you don't want to be in that, so you go another one. Go another way. It's very important. Take the means. You know that. Okay, this area, very bad. Go to the other street. This is, yes, it's more difficult, but this is better. Uh, some have set up, they used to do that to avoid the crowds of people. So they will not be pointed out, so-and-so is here and so-and-so is there. That's we're trying to protect our iman. Just that we don't want to be in an environment. And this is important, that the fitan is strong. Someone should remember that. When you see this fitan, you should not try to bear it. You should run from it, flee from it. Uh, this is in the summary. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua as well, always, for Allah, to give you sabat and your deen, to get you out of these things to that which is better. Because Allah, He helps the one who is looking for 
help and trying to seek his aid. Make dua. So important. Because how many people we've seen, na'udhi billah, they fell into these environments, and they never came out. They never came out. At some point they went up, at some point they came down, at some point they went this way and that way. And there's a lot. There's a lot of stories like that. So you yourself, you should be wary of that and be warned by that. You see that someone else, I know so and so, he was practicing, now he's not practicing very much. That's a warning for you. You give it his ibrah, okay? I'm, I'm going to be very serious. I can't, I can't do that. And even what you're doing, for example, work, you pick a certain work, you know that you can, have, it's not a work that's going to put you in test, even courses, some courses are fit enough versus others. Take the ones that are better for you. You have a choice. This is important. Take the means, Allah will aid you. But if you just, everything just is easy going, and you don't care, this is when things can happen. Wallah alam. It's just some, a little bit of advice. Wallah alam. This is the, some things from someone should try their best to do. Allah helps those who try to help themselves. But always seek your aid in Allah. Musta'inu billah. Always, Allah will aid you. Yes. Um, my question is, how do you become, I guess, more conscious of your environment? So what are some advice you can give to... Because a lot of people are in a certain environment and they don't realize that the environment they were in until... Well, that's the thing. The, the best way to realize if you're in a good or bad environment or the environment is affecting you is you have to have something that measures up against it. The more knowledge you have about Allah and about His religion, it gets you something that you can measure your society and environment with. A lot of times it's hard to judge if something right or wrong but this environment is toxic. If you don't have that much knowledge with you or that much uh, focus in the deen. The more you study and read and attend lessons and also you yourself are busy with knowledge in Islam, you say, you know what? I'm falling short. You know what? This, this thing is affecting me. But when you don't have that, you can't measure it. You think everything's fine. Because you're looking at a certain thing. Oh, you know what? School's going well, you know. I'm not doing anything that's major. You know, when people say that, talking about smoking and drinking, really. Right? But stuff like that. They say, oh, I'm not doing that kind of stuff, so I'm good. But we look more deep and say, hey, there's still other things I'm falling short of. For example, my friends are pulling me away from the salat time. I'm praying late. It's a problem. You know, or for example, I'm getting to class and I'm always in the group with the girls. This is not good. What's going on? You know, this is something you have to find. But we have more awareness about the religion than you have something to measure yourself. And that's what the kitab and sunnah, the knowledge we have in Islam, is the best deterrent from all the wrong. So the best thing someone can do is increase your knowledge, then you can measure your circumstances. But until then, all you can really do is just judge in the superficial. And it's not very good, right? And then by that time, when you grow, some years pass, you learn a little bit more, you get older, you say, subhanAllah. Doing all these things. Oh Allah, I wish I knew it was haram, I wish I knew it was wrong. But the thing is that the big thing that changed you, when you got older, you had more experience and knowledge, a little bit more. But if you study now, you focus yourself around some information, stay people who can benefit you, you'll be more conscious. This is important. You hang around people who can help you, remind you, because that's how believers should be, remind one another, okay, Akhi? You know, we got to make sure you don't do this, don't do that. You know, after class, we'll see you here. So we, can, we always work together. And that's going to keep you aware. But if you hang around... And you don't have much knowledge, you're not trying to increase your knowledge, everything starts to become slowly acceptable. Until so what happens, you start even rationalizing the worst of things. Yeah, it's not as bad, or what's wrong with that? And you start finding stuff, you don't even know what you're doing anymore. And this is very dangerous. So that, that's the best way to do it. And of course, if you hang around good brothers, they'll also give you, uh, sometimes a reminder, to boost you, get you out of that environment. But, if you do, but this is the key, stay away from the people who are always trying to keep you in these kind of environments, or in environments where are toxic, or not really eating your man. Maybe they're helping something else, but Iman is the most important thing. Allah Shall we end with this? Yes, you have one more? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, yeah, so I think there is a verse in the Quran which says, like, don't take your desires as your, your God. Mm. So, like, uh, like, is there some sort of, like, like fine line which like, determines like, at which point you've actually taken your desires as a God? Because someone... Like for example, someone can like watching movies a lot, right? But then is there like a, a point at, at which, like, he, like, at which he, he might commit shirk? Well, the also is that you worship your desires, you do whatever they tell you, whether it be halal, haram, uh, shirk, tawheed, it doesn't matter. So in many angles, the ulama say, whenever you disobey Allah, you commit any type of sin, there is ta'a there that you give into shaitan, some obedience. And that's why we said before, Shaykh Mathimah argued that any sin you do, you can say the outroot or the, the, the origin of it is that it's an act of shirk committed. Not that you're a mushrik, but it came from the fact that you give the obedience to shaitan versus Allah. It doesn't mean we say, oh, you, you worship with your desires. No, this is where it comes from, because ta'a belongs to Allah. So the person who is described this way, all they do is they follow their desires. And we see people that they will not wake up for salat or fajr, but they wake up for work. If they're hungry, they eat. If they're tired, they sleep. They don't care anything Allah ordered them. 
And the end of the day, this becomes like the ilah. It's like a salam, they're worshipping it. So a believer, of course, when he falls in desires, he's closer to that. But we can't say some of the time you fall in desires, you're not worshipping your desires, then you fall into shirk. No. Because you still have tawheed, you still understand that it's wrong, you may tell. So when someone should be careful is that what do they worship at the end of the day? Where's their veneration? Where's their love? Where's their hope? Where's their fear? Where's their obedience? Who do they belong to? And our society here in this environment, you see people. And you've probably seen people. All they do is what they want. No concern for Allah's religion or anyone's opinion. Whatever they feel like, they do it. And you see even physically, you can see on them. Even the way that they appear, they have lost it. The shahawat have gotten themselves to, to, to cut and to draw and to pierce and to remove. And you find them and say, subhanAllah. But the idea of the believer should be that always obedience belongs to Allah. So following desires that are halal, in the halal way, this is ibadah. But following desires which are haram and doing it is wrong. But we can't say every time someone falls into it and does it that he's worshipping his desires. But rather we should describe the one who is all he is following, all he's obeying, and all he, who he venerates. It's his desire, his shahawat, his experience. This is someone who is described this way. And that's why Allah described the mushrikeen this way. That they're like this. Whatever you bring them of truth, they don't follow. They follow whatever they want. وَمَنَ أَضَلَّ بِمَّا تَبِعَ هَوَاهُ بِغَيْرُ هُدَى مِنَ اللَّهِ Allah says, who is more misguided than one who follows his desires without guidance from Allah? So that's how we should look at it. When we fall into wrong, it's wrong. You make istighfar and tawbah, you understood. But if you did wrong, you say it's fine. What's wrong with it anyways? And then you do all, all you do is just that, then indeed, what are you worshipping? What do you have? You're captive to your soul and desires, as Mintaymiya says. You're a captive. And most people, what they need to reflect on is that you can only, you only have two choices in reality. Ibn Qayyim also says, you only have two choices. Either you have captivity to Allah, it's true servitude. And Allah already made sure all of us are servants. Yawm al-Qayyim, all of us are going to come to Him, abadan. We're all servants to Allah. So we're already servants. You're already there. But you submit to that servitude, this is the best position. Inna wa kana abadan shukura. Nuh was described as a grateful servant. Being a servant of Allah and described this way, it's the best of the, of the maqam or status someone can have. Or you can be a captive to your desires and your wills and your impulses and your hormones and whatever else. And we see most people, that's what happened. Ibn Qayyim ibn he summarizes in some lines, he says that essentially that, they try to run away from the, the riq, the kind of uh, slavery or servitude they were created for, and then they were captive, captive, may taken captive by their desires. And we are the wisrash of shaitan. Haqqan, that's it. If they, so if somebody believes it's, it's guided, to be guided, to be logic, it's logical, and to be, uh, to be a part of guidance, to follow your desires, versus the, uh, the will and, and the legislation of Allah, the all knowledgeable, the all perfect, all great, and this person misguided. And so really when you see people promoting the following of desires and doing whatever you want, you see you're captive to your desires. You can't even let go one thing, haram. And you see in them, they each do so many wrong, they can never leave it off. Whereas the believers, alhamdulillah, I'm a slave to Allah, not your my desires. And you find the people today in our side how bad they are regarding smoke and drink and entertainment. They can't leave anything off. They become captivated, something they die like this. And here they call it overdose, whatever. This is what it is. Right? This is any day, this is what it is. So Alhamdulillah, Islam gave us a, a cure from that. So that's how we say, someone who all he does is this. This is the person described. Not if someone, he loves something and he knows it's wrong, he keeps falling into it. This is someone who's addicted to a sin. He can remove it. He can remove it. And some people are like that. Maybe the whole life may be tested by it, but you never stop fighting against it until Allah SWT aids you to stop and it's also a reminder in general that we should always try our best to get rid of these things, these sins that we fall into. How could they ruin us? Even if it's just one. Some said after they mentioned the example, I think it was Hassan al and others of Shaitan. All the khayr that he did, once to do that he didn't do, to add him, to lower him, and he ruined his, all that he did. One actually ruined his efforts from before. It doesn't take much, right? So even for us, we shouldn't say, well, I've done a lot of good. And I think this is actually one of the things that people sometimes fall into. You do a lot of khayr and you justify with some wrong. So now I can do something wrong. So Shaitan leads people to that. So the believer should always, whatever khair I did, doesn't mean anything. Inna Allah min muttaqeen. Only Allah accepts those who have taqwa, so maybe it's all not accepted. I'll do more. And that's how the believer should be. In everything you did, who knows if it's accepted. Just forget about it. Do more good deeds. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tawfiq, that you have all khair. Whereas the person said, I did a lot of salah today, so I can justify doing something else, this is wrong. Alright, so Allah alam. Well, we shall end with this much. Subhanak bihamdik, shadu wa nayna, staqwa tu wa